And uh, I want to welcome everyone for this lecture this evening. Uh, it's great that you're here. Nice, nice full crowd for um, Jamie Maslin Larson. I want to thank our sponsors. They include the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, Graduate School of Oceanography, College of Arts and Sciences, the Society of Landscape Architects, the Rhode Island Chapter, and Landscape Forms. I will not tell you that you have to use their products. I want to also thank uh, our students. We have students who helped uh, with the reception this evening. And I would say just a reminder, on October 30th, Kate Orff is coming from SCAPE, also a New York firm. Um, and so you ought to mark your calendar. Tonight, we're very pleased to have Jamie Madeline Larson uh, of the firm West 8 speaking. A West 8 was established in Amsterdam and has a New York office, and Jamie is principal of that firm. She's a partner, managing principal, uh, registered landscape architect in New York, Florida, and Pennsylvania. She serves as the principal in charge of West 8's New York projects, or American projects, and some of them include Governor's Island, uh, it was a competition in 2007. The firm won the international competition and has since uh, designed the first phase of that park, and it opened up this year. Uh, she's also responsible as manager of Miami Beach Soundscape Project, which is a two-and-a-half-acre project in the heart of Miami Beach, Ontario Place in Toronto, and a master plan for Longwood Gardens. Uh, she's received awards and commendations. She's received an ASLA Honor Award for Governor's Island for the park and the public space in 2012, an AIA, American Institute of Architects, Honor Award for Regional and Urban Design for the Soundscape uh, Miami Beach Project. Uh, she's also received awards from the New York and Florida chapters of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And very important is the ability to win an international design competition, which was Governor's Island. She's spoken at the AIA annual meeting in Denver, ASLA annual meeting in Phoenix, which was 2013, and she's lectured at the Architectural League's annual student program at Rutgers University, Colorado State, and uh, in Nova Scotia. She received a Master's of Landscape Architecture from Utah State University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Northern Arizona University. But don't think she's not from the East Coast. She was born between Rochester and Syracuse in New York. <laughs> so we're pleased to have Jamie here this evening. And I just need to add, add one small piece, is that we wouldn't have Jamie here this evening, but her uncle, who she hasn't seen in 25 years, contacted me last spring and said, I have a niece. <laughs> and I said, so what does your niece do? Oh, she's a landscape architect. So he, had, he must have been familiar with our lecture series. And I said, great, send me some information on her. And so he sends me a blurb. And I go, oh, she's a principal of West 8? <laughs> so uh, Charles Waldheim, our last speaker, was speaking about the work that the firm had done in Toronto. And so it's a great connection, a little bit a landscape urbanist and a landscape architect. So I'd like everyone to welcome Jamie Maslin Larson. Thank you. I'm going to have to. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, thank you, William. Thank you, everybody, for um, having me here. This is really fun. We just had dinner with a few people, and um, I feel already uh, so welcome. And um, I am s especially warmed by having my uncle and aunt here tonight, who I haven't seen in 25 years. So um, they're right there in the middle. This is a little bit of a family reunion. and. Um, I titled my lecture tonight, um, What If Parks Could Dream? 
<clears throat> Part of this ties back to the Maslin family, which I'm a Maslin, um, because um, uh, we're a very practical group of people. We're very pragmatic and sober-minded. I am from uh, uh, a solid stock of, of folks. And um, one time my dad said to me, um, when we were uh, just graduated from undergrad school, and I wanted to move to Montana, and I had no job, and I had $200, and he thought it was the dumbest idea in the world. And uh, I said, well, Dad, you know, this is, this is a dream of mine. I really, I really want to do this. And he said, well, Jamie, you have your dreams, and then you have reality. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you and I are on a totally different planet. So um, I, ever since then, I... I've always felt that there is the possibility to merge dreams and realities together, and I've always, I've never felt that there's a way that you have to differentiate that. And my dad and I have talked about this. We're great, we're great friends, so it's not a bitter uh, ending to this. It was just a motivation for me, and I think it really reflects in the work of West State and the um, philosophy of how we um, we take things that are um, kind of maybe sometimes outrageous ideas and make them happen and it's through a great deal of perseverance and serious work that um, that we do our work so tonight I just want to focus on three projects um, both very different scales um, and um, talk a little bit about how some of our dreams became reality um, just by uh, sort of defining what we do as landscape architects you guys are students and practitioners and, and I'm not sure what else but um, uh, when we start a project oftentimes this is the kind of uh, situation we face which is this gray dismal uh, horrible context of, of uh, reality and um, uh, where where it takes an incredible amount of vision to imagine the possibilities and potential and um, everybody has uh, dreams everybody wants this to be the greatest New place in the planet, um, the you know the centerpiece of their of their community. The you know it solves all their problems. It creates redevelopment opportunities. It uh, you know brings families and communities together, um, and we we try to make all that happen. Um, but there are real uh, hardcore issues that we have to face when we start a project. Things like um, you know great you know poor uh, infrastructure um, isolation from downtown cores um, uh, environmental problems um, just the context of what the what the in what the um, weather is like can often be times challenging to these projects West State uh, is uh, founded in Rotterdam in the Netherlands and we've been around for 25 years uh, built projects all over the world our logo is a windsock um, which um, uh, is relating to the name West State. A lot of people ask, what does West State mean? Is it an address or something? But um, it's actually referencing the um, wind speed and the kind of force of wind out of the, out of the port of Rotterdam. So um, West is the prevailing wind speed, and 8 is, you know, the kind of, uh, on a scale from 0 to 10, dangerous but not life-threatening. So um, that's how the name West State came around. It's all about the kind of context of the environment, the, the sort of um, relationship of, of people to that context. And of course, as a Dutch firm, um, eight is when, uh, beyond eight is when the, um, when the uh, locks and dams get shut down um, so that they go into kind of um, protection mode because it's 30% uh, of the country is uh, under the sea level. So they really have to, um, really do a lot of work to protect their landscape um, and their and their livelihood. So um, uh, this is a firm, West State is a firm that's uh, deeply tied to the environment and kind of responding to these forces of um, nature. Uh, in New York office, um, uh, there's about 15 to 17 of us, depending on how many interns we have. Um, and then in Rotterdam, there's about 60 of us. Um, we're a mix of uh, in mostly in New York, we're architects and landscape architects, um, but in Rotterdam, we also have a team of industrial designers and graphic designers and um, more architects. Uh, so it's, it's a nice uh, 
diverse group. Um, our, 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 our firm is organized very horizontally, so um, we really try to get ideas from everybody uh, that works with us. It's not, um, there isn't like the profit and then all of us are disciples. It's very, um, very much ideas come from all of us. So it's a really um, fun environment. It's very much idea focused. We don't spend a lot of time talking about um, business. Um, <laughs> Uh, we spent a, a lot of time drawing and designing. Probably what put West State on the map was this uh, project in, the, in Rotterdam. It's called Scharbenplein, which means theater plaza. And this um, is sort of representative of what William was saying um, uh, about um, our firm being um, uh, what we're kind of known for, which is um, uh, this, this plaza is... Um, has these movable, um, these are actually, you can operate these, people can operate these light masts. They move up and down and shine spotlights on this very simple plaza. The whole idea was this was referencing uh, the heritage of the Port of Rotterdam, but also creating a kind of theater place, very flexible, open environment for people to make uh, their own kind of um, show. So there isn't program here in the way that you see and hear so much about in American parks now. This is like completely open-ended and really it's about sitting on the edge in these seats and um, watching people animate this and make their own show. So it's very highly programmed. Um, like I said, these are very sculptural um, um, light masks. They're oper operable and um, they really are the kind of um, focal point of this uh, community. We also have worked on large-scale redevelopment projects. This is in Amsterdam. This is an old port, Borneo Sporenberg. And we made a, a whole community here. We worked on the um, urban design guidelines and the public space to um, make this community. We also, as I mentioned, we have industrial designers. So we have a lot of infrastructure projects like bridges and so on. Um, this is one that's in Borneo Sporenberg. And part of what we do is um, in projects like this are really devoid of um, of, uh, you know, like human nature, human uh, sensitivity and kind of um, uh, feeling is to bring sort of life and joy and happiness to our projects by making things that make people smile. So this is, could have just been a straightforward bridge, but we made this crazy, windy, um, curvy bridge that really has brought identity to this neighborhood. And whenever I show this to our American, uh, clients, they just freak out because they think this is so dangerous and we could never do this here. <laughs> but, um, we also just finished, uh, as, as uh, William said, we, we win a lot of projects by competition. Um, we won a, a major competition in 2003 for about seven miles of riverfront in Madrid. Um, this is what it looked like before. Um, it was surrounded by, by highways. Um, this was basically the big dig of Madrid, so about 30 kilometers of highways were sunk and capped with parks, and we worked rapidly to um, complete this work. Um, this is what it looks like today, so this is one of our largest uh, projects that's been complete. Um, really, uh, we don't even know how much money was put in this because it's Madrid is like a whole other system of economy. and political movements, but um, what it's really done is stitched together these neighborhoods that were once separated by these freeways and now bringing this kind of uh, wonderful scale pedestrian experience, this sort of um, comfort and relaxation of um, playgrounds and, and promenades to um, back to the river. We also do, um, uh, we have sort of a, a work that along the way has been more artful. Um, this is actually a, a kind of a protest piece. A lot of the, like the United States, a lot of the countryside in the Netherlands is being eaten up by sprawl development. So we um, commissioned uh, giant sort of inflatable um, cows <laughs> to be sprinkled throughout the countryside to have people recognize that their agricultural landscape and their agricultural heritage is being eaten up by this kind of sprawl. And um, so uh, this was actually the cover of our monograph. Um, that was out several years ago, and um, uh, so we're, we're really, you know, into saving the environment. So I just want to start with a couple projects. Um, uh, these are focused on the work that the New York office has done, 
and we opened the New York office in um, 2008 uh, after we won the competition for Governor's Island. I was the first uh, American hire, and uh, since then we've built it up over time. Um, this project came um, in um, 2010. It's Miami Beach Soundscape, and this was actually uh, West State's first project that was built in the United States. So after 25 years, this was the first one built. It opened in January 2011. And when we started, uh, this was a parking lot, two and a half acre parking lot, right in the heart of Miami Beach. Um, Lincoln Road Mall is just over here. The beaches are right on the other side. Those, all those hotels are right on Ocean Drive and Collins Avenue. Um, but they were opening a uh, new um, Frank Gehry designed uh, institution called the New World Symphony. And this was kind of a graduate school for orchestral students. So kids from around the world who are like the best in show for um, you know, symphonies come here to, to work with Michael Tilson Thomas, who's a world famous conductor, uh, to sort of do their finishing school here. So we started and the building was um, uh, I'm halfway or more than halfway through construction and um, we uh, were really inspired by um, in, in this case uh, Frank Gehry's architecture wasn't didn't have all the swoopy stuff on the outside he put all the swoopy stuff on the interior um, so these were the kind of shapes and forms that we uh, we confronted when we first started this project and our approach to the project was to take those abstract them um, and have them kind of you know, spill out from the building into the park. So we created this kind of mosaic pattern of, of shapes um, and um, refined them over a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of work and study um, so that walking through this small park, uh, two and a half acres, uh, wouldn't be, you know, like, let's just get from A to B, but you actually had to sort of shift your views and shift your way you walk through the park and um, create windows and views based on, um, on that shifting experience. So in the end, it would feel, the park would feel much larger than it is because of the shifting views and, um, that you have along the way. And gently modulating the topography so it enhances the sense of enclosure. But really it was all about framing the uh, beautiful architecture and making it feel like an enclosed room from the streets that are around the perimeter. Um, a key piece of this building program was um, using the building um, for um, outdoor projections. So this is a 75 foot by 100 foot blank wall on the side and there's a projection tower here that shines and simulcasts the orchestra uh, from the interior uh, into the, in the outdoor experience. So this was a vision of Michael Tilson Thomas because he really wanted to bring a kind of uh, egalitarian experience to orchestra. This is no tuxedos and ball gowns experience. This is like hanging out in the, in the outdoors, having a glass of wine, letting your dog run around, and listening to beautiful orchestra music. So phenomenal. But our job was to try to integrate that into the park um, in a way that um, day to day it didn't feel like this big like plaza like space um, that it really felt like a park and then at night it would come alive so um, we worked with uh, another critical issue to make that day to day uh, experience really uh, comfortable in Miami Beach was shade it was very hot there um, and we worked with uh, Vicha palm trees which have a really skinny very skinny trunk, um, and uh, we studied a lot how these vicha palms can use uh, can can create a kind of a veil effect against the building to accentuate the sight lines of the building, but create shade at the same time. This is a lot of study. Um, one of those things that at the end of the day, um, I don't think people know how many volumes of studies we have on how. Um, how the palm trees work, but um, it was very tricky um, to balance out the desire to have open space and also deliver shade. Um, another piece that we had was um, a request from the city for a permanent shade structure, and this was um, because in Miami Beach there's hurricanes. Uh, if 
if there's a, a large hurricane and all of the trees are denuded, they really wanted to have uh, permanent shade structures so that it didn't look just like a wasteland. So we were inspired by the um, cumulus clouds here that are in Miami Beach, and we kind of fractured them and abstracted them. Um, and made these uh, pergola structures that are made out of uh, aluminum pipe. Um, here's a, an image of it when we were studying it in model. Um, and here they are installed. This was after opening day. Um, they're actually uh, really places uh, where these bougainvilleas, the bougainvilleas are now high. I was just there Tuesday. The bougainvilleas are just about this high now, and they're going to climb over the top and create this permanent shade environment, but they've also become quite sort of iconic for entering into the park and, um, and feeling like you've arrived. Um, this is the uh, giant projection wall um, and the, um, the, sh the uh, projection uh, equipment um, and this uh, world-class audio system. This was just in New York Magazine, uh, there was an article saying that this projection, outdoor projection sound is the best in the country. Um, you really, if you get to experience this, you'll be blown away. I bawled my eyes out when I heard the national anthem. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, this is beautiful. So, um, <laughs> but this is what it's like day to day now. Thousands of people come here to hang out and enjoy this place. Um, there's movies in the, co in the park, there's, um, there's these concerts in the park, and it's really become a part of the the like thing you do when you go to Miami Beach, and we're really proud of it. We're really proud that the community loves it. Um, it's very simple. Um, it it's it was a very low cost project. It's pretty much lawn, palm trees, and concrete, uh, but it's really um, taking those simple materials and and twisting them in a way that makes it look um, totally one of a kind. Um, I'm so glad this this worked. I wasn't sure if it would work. Um, <laughs> So another thing we just finished up um, was um, uh, another competition that happened over the last year or so in New York City, uh, sponsored by uh, HUD, um, which was um, in response to Hurricane Sandy. So um, we had, uh, there were 10 teams that were asked to uh, work on uh, ideas to um, respond to um, uh, in increasing storm events and climate change in uh, basically from New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Our project we called uh, Blue, du Blue Dunes, and we specifically called it a research initiative because it's, um, it's a, a big idea. I think Kate Orff will be here in a few weeks, so she'll hopefully talk about hers. This is brilliant. Um, and she's uh, moving forward with some of that work. So um, a lot of good stuff came out of this, and a lot of projects are moving forward. Ours is a little aspirational. Um, so uh, I just want to explain it tonight um, because this is a big idea. So talking about dreams, this one's large. Oh, this is too bad. On my screen, you can see um, the coast here of uh, the East Coast on a large scale. Um, one of the things that was troubling about this uh, is troubling about the political context around any initiatives that happen <coughs> to solve you know, these major problems is that our political system is divided into very specific um, you know, uh, jurisdictions that don't nest together in a way that solves big problems all the time. So it's been a long time since we've done anything like the Hoover Dam. You know, it's been a long time since we've saved as a country major uh, national areas of national na natural um, treasures. Um, so there, there isn't the sort of, um, now I don't want to get political here, but it's true that there isn't the sort of federal agenda on issues like this. Um, it tends to be more localized. And so um, that, that to us uh, was a challenge that we wanted to provoke a little bit um, because these issues aren't jurisdictional. They really don't come down to local initiatives. Um, if you really want to solve them, we felt you need to take a bigger look like on the level of, you know, 
some like the interstate highway system that we built across the country. Um, so as you know very well, um, you live in this area, uh, there's, there's not only the problem of hurricanes, but nor'easters. And when these were combined, like in Super, Superstorm Sandy, they can be um, incredibly damaging. Um, there are um, issues of, you know, blah, blah, you, you know all this. Um, so um, the com combination of uh, high tide and storms can create uh, detrimental effects on our, um, our waterfronts. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of money at stake, no doubt. Um, and the solutions are oftentimes highly engineered. So um, we think that when you're talking about thousands of miles of coastline, these sort of highly engineered approaches are single-minded, maybe um, problem-oriented and not holistic in their, um, in, in their vision. Um, we focused on you know, the whole coastline, but in particular, there's issues um, um, along um, in the sort of New York City Harbor area where um, the Hudson River is actually uh, a part of this whole system of exchange um, in, the, in the New York Harbor. And it's incredibly important that anything we do um, keep that exchange um, open. Um, but at the same time, um, because of the way the, the, the landscape is formed, it actually channelizes the problem in the, in the context of, um, of uh, these combination uh, nor'easters and hurricanes, and it, it creates a double down effect um, right at the middle of you know, the, the largest city in the United States. And so what we know is that when you have a kind of a curved coastline, these things deflect. Um, so that was a sort of a high level um, concept that we wanted to play with. So um, our idea was to create a large barrier island, a series of large barrier islands off the um, entire eastern seaboard. Um, so that you would um, create, uh, you know, a, effectively a, a kind of a barrier that would not only stop the velocity, um, but then change the course of um, the uh, of the of the of the water as it was approaching there. Um, so this is the scale of of the development. You can see um, coming, you know, clear up all the way down um, in a series of barrier islands all along the coastline. Um, particularly, um, uh, you know, focusing around the New York Harbor um, for this study. We, z we zoomed in a little bit closer here. Um, now, benefit. <laughs> Um, a benefit in creating all these uh, off coastal dunes is that you get a very new, rich ecology off of the off of the water. Um, we could imagine a time we could imagine that this would be destination for recreation. Um, easily a desire for anybody who lives in New York and um, along the coast, where this is one of the d most densely populated areas of uh, the world. So, um, creating a beautiful ecological experience that. Um, restores uh, which, which is which was once wiped which is now wiped away by uh, all of the development that occurs along Long Island and um, and the Jersey Shore. This wasn't just a, a fantasy of ours. We actually worked with the Stevens Institute uh, to test and model these ideas. Um, so this is 90% uh, science and 10% um, fantasy. We actually, through uh, modeling, um, uh, learned that we actually, this works. Um, we do uh, have benefits of reducing the, um, the velocity and the volume of water that actually um, would, would meet. Um, you can focus on um, the, the sort of colors in the, in the middle there. Um, and you can see how the, how the colors change um, because of the dunes. So blue is good. The higher tones are bad. <coughs> um, 
And this is the this is an analysis of the actual water volume and the height of the of the sea and the height of the water at the storm, uh, showing that it's actually lowered quite a bit substantially. Um, and so we actually estimate, we actually contacted a lot of um, risk management and uh, we contacted the um, insurance uh, uh, auditors and so on um, to get us involved in understanding like actually monetarily how much could we potentially save from, from working on this project. And, um, and then from a uh, you know, business development side, um, you know, these communities uh, have a lot of concerns. A lot of these communities are all about their waterfronts. You know, there's um, certainly um, uh, important to keep the livelihood of these communities in line. So we we worked on how do we re how do we keep um, these programs and and identities and um, creating new kind of infrastructure and new areas of tourism and new areas for play and new areas for ecology to be integrated into these dunes. Um, Another issue was, um, yeah, fishing, the livelihood of fishing, um, and also shipping, because that's a very large port, and we need to ensure that these, fishing, these shipping lines would also be uh, valid when you build up barrier reefs. So this is all uh, modeled and feasible. So we somehow imagine that this, there's this like, other layer of uh, activity beyond the New York Harbor that's, that's really active in commerce, that's active in recreation, that's active in nature. Um, again, uh, tons of modeling about uh, the effects on ecology, um, how do we create and enhance new ecologies without um, undermining the ecologies that exist along the ocean. We learned that we could, um, we could create more ecology um, through these dunes. Um, and then there's the sort of like, how do you actually do it? <laughs> Can you do this? How do you build dunes in the middle of the ocean? Um, part of it was in analyzing the uh, heights of the continental shelf and uh, the geomorphology and the sediment types here. Um, uh, I won't get too into it, but um, this also isn't, um, has never not been done before. People are in the Netherlands are building uh, these same sort of uh, offshore dunes now. And of course, there's other projects that um, in Dubai where you're building off-site islands and so on. So uh, the, the technology isn't even a technology to build this. There's, um, it's quite rudimentary. It's actually just not um, legalized in the United States yet. <laughs> um, it has to do a lot with these old-fashioned shipping laws and um, where you can't have um, the, these sort of tanker trucks that construct these islands in the Netherlands and in Dubai, they like suck the sand from one part of the ocean and dump it in the other. Like, there's laws in the United States that you can't have these uh, foreign um, tanker trucks like dock in the in the United States waters. So, there's federal laws that have to be changed in order for this to work. But it didn't stop us. We measured the quantity of uh, of uh, of material that uh, we would need to do the blue dunes and the costs. Um, and we really, um, we took very seriously like the feasibility and the kind of image and the identity of how this could work. Um, at the end of the day, it could be a very romantic kind of beautiful destination and we think, um, we think uh, there's lots of uh, value in, in further studies for this and uh, HUD has been very supportive of continuing efforts to um, integrate some of these principles and doing a pilot project to, um, to have this move forward. Um, so what brought us to the United States was Governor's Island um, Park and Public Space Project. This is in uh, New York City, um, where I live, and um, we've been working constantly. We're still working on Governor's Island. Um, this is a multi-phase project, and it's been uh, really exciting working on it. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Governor's Island around uh, 2006. It's in the middle of the New York Harbor. It's 172 acres and for almost as long uh, as, well actually as long as uh, uh, Europeans have been here, uh, this has been used for military purposes. Before that, the Native Americans 
uh, use this um, uh, for, um, you know, uh, gathering. There was a lot of this is a lot of um, nuts on this island. They called it Nutten Island. Um, but anyway, um, so it was a military base for a very long time, and then President Clinton, when he um, decommissioned a lot of military bases, this one was uh, put up for um, closure. Um, at one time, there was 10,000 people working here and 3,500 people living here. And um, when the, the federal government decided to give it to the city of New York for a dollar, um, and that was a great, it was probably the second greatest real estate deal in New York history. But, um, but nobody knew what to do with it. There's no subways that go here. Um, there's all these buildings. Um, you know, clearly it's in an awesome location, but how do you, what do you do there and, and um, how do you make it a destination or a kind of a new part of, of the city? Um, there were some, uh, some requirements that came with the transfer. Uh, one was that um, uh, it, the North Island here, this, this, is, uh, this is actually the original island. All of this is landfill from the Lexington Avenue subway line in the 20s. Um, the North Island was a historic district, <coughs> so that had to be, you know, preserved and restored. And all of its buildings uh, it was made a national landmark. Uh, the perimeter road needed to stay open for public use, so um, needed to be accessible at all t for the for public enjoyment. Uh, in the South Island, 33 acres could be set aside um, for new development, and then 40 acres of the South Island had to be new park. Now, the new development, there is no um, casinos allowed. There was uh, also no private residential housing allowed. So Donald Trump could never build a big tower right here. They, the federal government said, this is, a, this is a public asset. We always want it to be a public asset. So, um, but it left a lot of questions about what do you do there. You know, you could put college campus here. You could put a, um, you know, cultural institutions. You could put restaurants. You could put hotels. But how does that start? You know, how does that, how does that get going when um, nobody knows about this place? I mean, literally, it was off maps of New York City. You can go, you can find maps, and it's not on maps. So <laughs> nobody knew about it. It was like this weird thing that was nobody ever went to in a city of eight million people. So um, the the decision was made to um, to first. Uh, build a park, and when if you guys were all developers, you would say that's crazy because you can't start redevelopment by building a park. You have to start with development. But our very smart clients said no. A park actually can shape the development. It can shape the identity. It can shape the future of what the very nature of this uh, place is. So uh, they launched an international design competition. And we won, um, and we uh, immediately started asking ourselves, you know, what is the, what is this park to New Yorkers? Like, how does this park relate to the way New Yorkers experience parks? And we knew it was pretty much the opposite of Central Park, where uh, Central Park is uh, stitched in with the neighborhood. You know, you cross through it. It's uh, millions and millions of people. Uh, come here every day, but a lot of those people are people who just live here who are just crossing through or walking their dog or hanging out or taking a bike ride. Um, and so it's a part of the daily destination. In, in Governor's Island, you have to take a ferry to get out there, so this needed to be a draw. You need to have enough to do. You had to have enough excitement out there um, that you, y y because everybody that was going to this place was making an effort, you know. Um, so we felt that you needed to at least kind of like we need to have a lot, at least two hours of good times out here. Um, so that was part of what we decided. Um, the other piece is that this is an island um, 
And New Yorkers, even though we live, I live in Manhattan, you don't experience Manhattan as an island. You experience it as a city and hardly ever um, feel the sensation. Like many of us don't get to feel the sensation of being on an island and the sort of beauty, beauty of the sky day to day in our lives. So we really wanted to enhance, enhance this experience of being on an island. And it only takes 45 minutes to walk around the perimeter, so it's a little island. Um, and that was really important to us too. And just getting there was part of the fun. So you take a ferry, you know, all of a sudden the city is like miles away, even though you've just 500 uh, yards from the edge of Manhattan. So this is our master plan from 2009. Um, you can see the development zones. We, we shaped the development zones. We located two different uh, areas. And um, we created a vision for this um, this uh, new public space. To give you a sense of what we, you know, a deeper sense of what that vision is about, um, this is an early picture of Governor's Island um, right after they kind of finished a landfill project. And, you know, this was right after, this was around uh, World War I. So, I'm um, oh, sorry, World War II. So this was clearly a, a shipping and exchange kind of place. It was all about logistics. They didn't have any, uh, you know, they didn't like shoot guns out here. Uh, this was really just about um, providing the infrastructure and support for the troops. So it was very utilitarian, you know, to make a flat land and put these sort of barrack buildings out there. It made a lot of sense, but it didn't really create a great park-like feel when we got on board. Um, this was flat, 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 um, and naked, so it was quite ugly. Um, a lot of the areas that were perfectly suitable for military uses, large, vast areas of um, asphalt uh, needed to be rethought of, and um, the trees that were there were kind of twisted and suffering because of this harsh environment and lack of real topsoils. <coughs> Our concept was that um, in order for this place to be uh, uh, a destination, it needed to have its own kind of skyline, its own kind of presence within the context of the, the, the presence of New York City skyline. So we had this idea that um, we would build sort of our green, green skyscrapers out in the middle of New York Harbor. And um, part of this uh, notion of building, lifting, and sculpting the island was these um, culminates in these green skyscrapers is that it is in the middle of the New York Harbor. Um, as a Dutch company, um, we're constantly thinking about the environment, as I mentioned, and um, we needed to um, take into account sea level rise and climate change um, so that this park investment would be protected in the future and these trees would grow to be healthy for the next hundred years. So we, we really fundamentally had this notion of taking topography and sculpting that flat barren landscape to make this new park. So in every sort of detail we were measuring, you know, sea level rise, uh, testing it uh, against our topography, but creating a beautiful place to be that you wouldn't even know, you're, you wouldn't experience it as some kind of infrastructure project. You would just experience it as a park. Uh, cr so we created two-level promenade so that these trees could be out of the brackish water. Um, you still have a lower promenade, but um, the trees in the future would be um, protected. This is just a sequence of drawings we did in the early days. Um, this is the original island, like I said. Um, this is uh, what, what um, the um, projected, the red line is the projected um, uh, 100 year flood line, um, the old, they're changing it now, but this is the projected 100 year flood line. Uh, um, you can see that um, the entire island, most of the South Island would be flooded where our park is and where the development zone would go. So through this bringing in uh, new fill material and sculpting that landscape, we created a new datum and the new datum actually um, creates a new a new building level for these development zones. And we were doing this in 2009, well before anybody was talking about um, these things. And uh, we actually had to do a lot of work to convince our client 
to pay for this film material, um, that it was worth the investment. Because there's millions of dollars going into this. Now, we did do a lot of recycling of these old buildings that were on the island and reused them, but we still needed to import some more. So we were in construction when Hurricane Sandy happened. Sorry, I'm just curious what you used for sea level rise numbers. It was, um, it was the UN's um, um, climate change study from 2006, something like that. That's good. Um, so when Hurricane Sandy happened, we were in construction on the park. And it was just sort of some of this gray film material was out there. And um, the flood came in. Uh, so that datum you saw was, um, was about, you know, we were building this. So the datum was here. But Hurricane Sandy came in two feet higher than that datum. So it actually lapped, lapped at the edges of our new, new elevation. We weren't sure what was going to happen. You know, we, we knew we were doing the right thing, but when the hurricane came, it was um, quite nerve-wracking because um, we were being tested really early. Um, and, uh, but in fact, um, all of the contractors had parked their vehicles on top of this sea level material. And um, you can see this was, this was like the level where, where Hurricane Sandy came because it, it just sort of squished this material, but it was bone dry and it was solid as a rock. And we were quickly, um, we were quickly like, everybody was calling everybody, you know, in the city to see how everybody was doing. And we were quickly like, yeah, everything's fine. Like, there's not a problem here. We've got a park. It's going to be great. And uh, we were very lucky um, to um, have uh, thought of this I say we're very lucky to have thought of this, but we're very lucky to have a client that allowed us to take this uh, vision to, um, to uh, reality, because it's a very challenging thing um, to take on. So um, this is sort of the simplistic plan of um, what we're, we're building. We built this piece of the park now. It's about 30 acres, and we're in construction on this second piece we call the hills. This is the third phase. Um, so that red line is the datum. And this is what it'll look like eventually. Um, phase one is, uh, uh, includes um, lots of um, uh, this sort of afforestation area. This is a vision from the master plan. Um, so this forest, like I said, will be um, protected for years and years and years. We were. Uh, recognized in one of the documents that came after Sandy, Sandy success stories um, as uh, a kind of a blueprint for, um, for best practices for park building. Um, we opened this summer um, uh, the first phase and uh, just want to show you some of the more artistic shots during construction. Um, this is the fill material, so it was a combination of the demolished buildings on the island and then just uh, quarry material from uh, the Hudson River. It was all barged in. 80,000 cubic yards uh, plus an additional uh, 40,000 cubic yards of soil that we manufactured on site. This is it in construction. And then we, um, to uh, kind of frame and celebrate that investment, uh, we created this sort of white eyeliner around these we call these petals. And this white eyeliner um, helps accentuate the topography. This is uh, over three miles of precast concrete that was made in Buffalo, New York. Um, who, the guy went to the sauerkraut festival, by the way, Uncle Dave. Um, so um, <laughs> this, uh, this precast it does a lot of things. Uh, normally, between uh, there's, this is like a planted area, and this would be an asphalt path. Normally, you have a steel edger there, but this is replacing that steel edger. And it's creating a, a kind of a visible edge that helps guide people. Um, it creates a mo strip. Um, but it also, um, like I said, accentuates the topography and um, the, s the sight lines and the, and the beauty of these shapes. Um, this is it open this summer. Um, and you can see how it creates this um, Wizard of Oz effect, where you just want to walk down that path. You want to see what's around the corner. 
We also whoa, built uh, a really large uh, garden uh, that's in the forecourt of, of uh, this area. Um, and this, this little sort of forecourt garden is as large as Bryant Park alone. And we worked with this sort of hedge shape to uh, kind of mimic those petal shapes and to create fun play areas for little kids. So this isn't like playground play, but it's really fun for kids to run around these things. It's water features. Um, so this is a really, really the heart of Governor's Island in terms of they have food carts and concessions and so on. And um, by the way, there isn't one single piece of all of these buildings are totally empty. There isn't there isn't anything to do out here except hang out in the park. And this summer, there's a half a million people that came out here. So you can't you can't go to a restaurant. You can't there's no museums. There's nothing to do here except hang out in the park. And so. Um, there's a lot of programming that our client does, um, but people in New York just want to relax. You know, they just, there isn't really a lot of programming here, actually. We said we had to have two, two hours or two and a half hours of things to do, but we ended up not, not doing much except having relaxing areas for people to hang out. Um, so now we're in construction on the second phase, and that's building what's the culmination of this topography, and we call it the hills. So it, this area, you know, sculpts and shapes and shifts, and it's very traditional landscape architecture. It's totally a knockoff of Frederick Olmsted. Um, but it culminates in these hills. Um, this is just a model shot, uh, but we created four hills. Um, and uh, the tallest one is about 70 feet high. It's called Outlook Hill. And there's an ADA accessible path all the way to the top. The other three ha each have their own kind of identity. Um, and I was just out there yesterday, and what the, the um, second highest hill, this is the view from the second highest hill, and you get this 360 degree panorama of New York City that blows your mind. Um, <laughs> so in just a couple years, you'll be able to come out here and go to the top of this hill and see this view of the New York Harbor um, which will be uh, really, really mind-blowing. So uh, here it is in construction a few months ago, and um, I love this shot. Uh, um, this contractor, when he was building this, he came out and he was like, man, oh man, this is the greatest project in the world, you know? I mean, my friends are working on highways in New Jersey, and I got this job, and this is so awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm taking pictures and showing these uh, people at parties. Nobody's seen this view of New York ever, ever. And I said, man, you get it, you know? It's so cool. It's, it's really awesome. It doesn't, it was a really great moment for me, so. So, uh, thank you. Yes. You know, everything out here is, is artificial, right? So, um, and our ambition is to create an incredibly healthy forest. So, um, all of the soils are manufactured. Um, they're, they're actually were mixed on site. Um, we have uh, six different soil types and nine different soil profiles. So, um, each for these different plant communities, from ball fields to um, more acidic soils in Liggett, um, where the hedges are. Um, uh, it was hard work because um, of the pressure to um, construct this in a certain time frame. And last winter, you know, we had a really bad winter. Uh, we had a uh, we worked with pine and swallow um, soil scientists, um, and they're crazy, freaky, nerdy, great 
soil scientists that uh, have built some of the most complex urban projects in in um, in New York City and around around the country. So they know these issues. Um, we um, we basically had a profile of this, you know, this engineered stuff, which is basically iner inert. There's no biological properties there, and then uh, had three feet of uh, soil um, where the trees are, and a foot of soil where the um, where the grasses are, and um, we also like added this, you know, biological goo that has like amoebas and you know, little creepy crawly stuff that accelerates um, the, the um, replication of a natural soil system. But um, one of the things that um, I think um, one of the areas we called hammock grove, you saw that like picture, the rendering of like giant trees. Um, we actually, you know, for, th for this, um, we created a, an afforestation project kind of in the heart uh, right here. Um, and because we really wanted this to be a, for a healthy forest in the future, we had a, a whole different planting strategy that, um, that um, to, be, to be honest, I haven't seen it in an urban park before. But um, we, the climate here is very unique, so uh, we were worried about investing in trees that were like, you know, two and a half, three inch caliper you know, and spreading them out, putting lawn underneath that you see in a typical kind of park installation. So we, um, we planted trees, um, the, you know, 46 different species of native kind of uh, trees um, in like inch and a half caliper. And we planted them on <laughs> five foot on center. And then we um, underplanted those with um, with, uh, I mean we call them sacrificial trees. So these are the kind of trees that are like helping to, you know, accelerate the nitrogen in the soil. And these are like the kind of trees that they put in, um, you know, slash and burn major recovery um, kind of uh, installation projects. So these, these trees um, are under, the, these trees are uh, planted alongside the beauty queen trees, the ones that we want to keep. And so this looks like a, like a, a, a dunescape right now because there's so many trees there. But what they're doing, it's creating a competitive environment for these trees. And it's also, um, because they're planted young, um, they're going to be able to adapt to this unique environment. And for sure, not all of them will, will survive. We don't want them to survive. It's survival of the fittest, in fact. So that um, the ones that live are like, they're the ones that'll be the forest of the future. These areas, so nine acres of the 30 acres is this uh, planting strategy. We call it hammock grove. And it's actually fenced off with snow fencing. And for five years, it'll be fenced off. And you can imagine when you're building a public park in New York City and you're saying, oh, for five years, no one will be able to access that part of the park. We were, we're, we were really nervous. People would demand that we take down the fences because they want to get in there. But people are cool. They get like, all right, you're building a good forest. Like, we can wait five years. So after five years, we'll take the fences down, and we're going to see what's lived. And we're going to start. We have to self-select. We also have to sort of have the hand of God here and, and cull out those that we don't think are great trees. So over time, this sort of between trees dying and us sort of playing the hand of God, we're going to uh, make a really healthy forest. But part of that is all this leaf litter and, you know, all that stuff is going to make the soil so much richer over time. And we don't get that benefit a lot, you know, and as landscape architects, it's so much like build it, construct it, get it done, get people in there, get people even using it. So um, it was, uh, it was great that our, again, our client was recognized the kind of need to make a very healthy um, plant environment for for this place to survive. Now, I'm going on and on, but uh, for the hills, these are slopes that are, you know, are, we have everything from the most laid back slope is about three to one, but we have slopes that are one to one. So, uh, you that angle of repose that you drew there, you know? Yeah, like, I, I it's really I happening. So, we, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, 
These are no dumb hills. So it's not only the it's the geotechnical engineering uh, for this was incredibly serious. So we had uh, engineers, geotechnical engineers from Seattle, who are used to working in wet, earthquake-prone areas um, on our team. Um, and most of these um, engineering solutions are in like you know land dikes, and um, you see them a lot in. Um, uh, landfills and um, you know dams and things like that. So we were taking these technologies and using them to build these ar artificial landscapes. Um, so it's ge on the sl on the sort of slopes that are three to one or less. We don't have to do any geotechnical engineering, <coughs> and we don't have to do any um, soil reinforcement other than like you know a, a sort of mat erosion control mat right after installation. But on slopes from three to one to two to one or Sorry, yeah, three to one to two to one. Um, we use uh, geotechnical mat, uh, geotechnical fabric, and sort of build these, um, build up the the landform like sausages. So you you lay out the fabric, you put the soil down, you wrap it up, and then you put more soil down and wrap it up, um, and then you can put the topsoil on the front of this and use core logs and staking to uh, reinforce that edge and um, you seed right away so you, you you get grasses in there to kind of um, keep the soils in. Now on the slopes that are two to one to one to one you have to use a, a kind of a cage system. Um, mechanically stabilized earth is this cage system that um, essentially holds back the slope um, and holds back the soil so you can plant in the side. It's totally done. However, most of these people that design these mechanically engineers, you know, the, the manufacturers of the mechanically engineered surfaces, like I said, are working on landfills and, um, uh, you know, dams and stuff, and they don't like to see trees coming out of it, you know. They're like, don't ever put trees there, you know, because that's a real problem. Trees are a problem. We're like, no, we want to stuff it with trees. Is that okay, you know? <laughs> uh, so, but, um, yeah, this is, this is a big, uh, exciting, uh, I wouldn't say experiment, but um, <laughs> but it's going to be very uh, totally, uh, you know, very very. I don't know of any other urban parks that are that are doing this kind of stuff. Yes. Oh, like yeah, she's. Uh, it's the Trust for Governors Island, and it's um, her name's Leslie Koch, and um, so the Trust for Governors Island is a. Is basically kind of a, it's like an agency that works, that's 100% funded by the city, but it's in charge of redevelopment of the island. So it's a small client group. It's like, it's like five of us in the room at the most at any one time. So, yeah. Yes? I'm just curious. Currently, the docks are only for charities, right? Yes. In the future, do you think that it'd be accessible to the public? Like, like if I had a boat to come there for a day, is we that something that we talked a lot about it. It's just very, um, it's, it's not, um, it's not easy because the demand is so high and there's a lot of issues in the New York waterway. So there's ferry that comes, uh, this ferry comes from here to here, like in the summer, it carries about a thousand people in their bikes. Um, in the summer, there's also a ferry from Brooklyn that goes here, but they don't allow private boats. I mean, okay, so Beyonce and Jay-Z got to park there once, <laughs> but not you and me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, this is a great podcast. Um, <coughs> the Blue Dunes in particular, where Mo and I are running a, a studio right now with um, a, a, both seniors and grad students looking at storm resilience issues for their working waterfront up in Providence. And um, <coughs> I'm curious about uh, shifting scales the way that you did for the Blue Dunes project. It seems like that scale is really different from the scale that landscape architects typically work at. And also, you were working with a research institute on that project yep. in a way that seemed also kind of novel. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the challenges <coughs> of shifting scales like that and um, and of working with, with an institute, on, you know, with a research group um, on that kind of project that just seems so different 
Yeah. Be because I think we can maybe see this <coughs> as the future, as one path future for some of the students that, you know, that are coming to our It's program. a great, um, landscape architecture is a great area of expertise for um, uh, bringing holistic thinking around systems. So um, engineers might try to solve problems. No offense to engineers. We love problem solvers, but when you're talking about places where humans um, live, work, play, like landscape architects think, think about those things uh, in ways that are more, you know, where they see relationships between these things together. Um, we actually are now just starting a competition in, um, uh, New or in, in uh, Louisiana. It's called Changing Course. Um, so that'll be um, uh, the sort of new rebuild by design, the uh, competition that we just finished with Blue Dunes. But this is looking at the whole lower Mississippi River and the Delta um, and how um, sedimentation and like there's huge problems with sedimentation and deposition in the lower Mississippi River and how it's affecting ecology and the working livelihood and so on. And the real need to solve um, to solve those problems, or or else these communities and these livelihoods, and these industries are going to die. I mean, huge swaths of cities and and um, industries are not going to be around anymore if this isn't addressed. So we're we're teamed with an engineering firm, a very large, you know, giant engineering firm. But w they called us because they know that we we bring this sort of human scale and the kind of um, uh, rash, uh, balanced thinking about how how ecology plays a role and how fishermen can can contribute to that and how economy is so tied to these industries and how how recreation can be a part of the sales and the value of these um, solving these problems. Um, so um, it's um, it's kind of um, you know it's not. Within our office, there are, um, you know, we have all sorts of skill sets. Um, so it's, but we do have people that are literally working on the detail scale of like, how does that, how does that come together to like these holistic things? Um, we try to keep, we try to keep all these scales in our office because it's just more fun to be honest. But um, it's it's key for us too is we're not like shoving our philosophy down anybody's throat. It's really like there's experts and 90% of what we do is facilitate these conversations and help in prioritizing. And so um, I think landscape architects are good listeners and um, we can see, you know, how these, these um, kind of individual um, ex expertises, how, how we bring those experts together into a, a, a whole vision. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a great project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, I had a few questions that come that jump out. Uh, looking at your project, is there a principle that guides your work? Like you've got angles angles on your land forms that are impossible to stabilize without geotextiles or, or soil mixes that are, n are certainly not natural. And then you have plantings that you'd like to have an ecology probably suited for the area. What rules, what guides what you ultimately choose? Well, I think what, what we like to do is um, One of the things that, if you go to our website, um, you, you'll see we have work all around the world. And um, none of it, I don't think, looks like the other project. So when we first start a project, we really dig deep into what this place is about. What's the identity? What's the soul? You know, And we go right to the plants, to be honest. Like, we're, we're landscape architects. We go plants, history, culture. You know, like. What is this? What is the DNA of this place? You know, it's really an inspiration. So on Governor's Island, it was like, how do we, how do we bring the sensation of being on an island 
to this place and getting up and seeing the water around the perimeter was like it's what we have to do right and um, mm -hmm. how do we do that oh well we can figure it out so um, we didn't want to build architecture we wanted to build you know not a tower we wanted to build landscape um, so that's a very a very important principle is to look at the unique quality of the site um, and kind of derive the source from that and then we also mix um, very pragmatic thinking with um, delight and fun. And I love that about our practice, too, because um, we're not, um, I don't know, we get, we get like people just, people come to parks to have a good time. You know, this isn't, this isn't like, uh, you know, hospital you know this is like a fun thing to do people want to smile they want to be with their family they want to have a sandwich and so sometimes it's okay to just have a little joy in what we do and, and exploit that a little bit so um, we you know even though some like soundscape um, we knew there was a small budget and um, but we made these crazy we sort of invested all our money in this very cool sculptural thing and left the, le the rest be very simple. So it's like, it's a kind of mix of pragmatic thinking and, um, and uh, wanting to have, just have a s bring a smile to something. I think it's important. Yes? Well, um, there were, uh, it's funny, I was, I was out there yesterday with um, some folks from San Francisco and they're like, we really think it's a bad idea to have any development go <laughs> on how long that edge. I was like, I know, but it is a redevelopment project. But um, all of these areas, so here and along that edge, have to go through a whole rezoning process and design guidelines and all this other stuff. There's um, a lot of projects that are happening in New York City right now, like big, big projects. So all of, you know, uh, the whole area here, mid Midtown, there's massive um, redevelopment projects happening. And so it's a little slow coming to New York City, or sorry, to Governor's Island. Um, the park just opened and um, the, uh, they had to do, uh, you know, rebuild the seawall and get drinking water out there and like all these infrastructure projects are now ready so right it is the, it is the big question um, what and in fact it was kind of depressing because our park opened and we we're like yay maybe the press will say something about the park you mm -hmm. know that'd be great and you read the article yeah there's a new park West State designed it it's really cool but what is gonna happen with the redevelopment blah 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 blah, blah. and we're like come on just give us a little more love you know um, everybody wants to know about the redevelopment, and it just what what literally has to happen is the uh, trust for Governors mm -hmm. Island needs to put out a request for proposals for ideas from developers, and um, you know the, I think they need to know like when the right time, what's the right time for that to happen. Um, we have a new administration, and um, he has a vision for what his priorities are, and I think um, uh, the, they're great great ideas um, but it's really not about building a he, he's very interested in affordable housing and since there is very little housing that can go out here then uh, it's it's time will tell but in the meantime we're building the second phase of the park so why don't you take one more for now oh. and then if we have other questions that remain you can talk uh, Jamie afterwards? Yeah, I have a question about your first project in Miami Beach, two parts actually. Um, first is what construction materials did you use to create those pergolas that look so flexible? And then did you guys do like testing and modeling to see if they would withstand hurricane wind speeds and everything else that comes with a hurricane? Yeah, we did. Um, they're, they're aluminum and the foundations are enormous. Um, because uh, we um, we had to um, 
uh, we did a lot of testing of that. And so um, one of the things that's great is we have um, we worked in we work in 3D all the time, and um, we had this exchange with our structural engineer, pretty much like every day. We'd send him a model, he'd do some, some, some analysis on it, and show like it literally shows like hot spots and so on. He'd come back, and we'd tweak this here or there. It was very iterative. It was very cool. Very good structural engineer, um, but it yeah it was um, a challenge because um, we didn't want it to look like. Um, uh, you know, the, we, we didn't want these big pipes, and the, the pipe size is really quite small. Um, and so um, it didn't, it, it felt light and airy still, you know, it didn't look like heavy handed. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Well, I would like to say thank you very much. And if you do have questions that you would like to ask um, about the sauerkraut festival <laughs> or anything, please. Uh, ask your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>